Oh, thank you. Shucks. Hello, everyone. It's, um, it's so lovely to have you all here in person today and to get to see all of your faces um, or half of your faces. They all look delightful regardless. Uh, before we begin, I want to start with an acknowledgement that we are on the sovereign lands of the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation, and tonight we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging for their sacred custodianship. Um, hello and welcome, my name is Jan Fran, and this is the third session of our Walkley's Live series, The Journalist Gene, where we're going to talk to eight award-winning journos about their extraordinary work. Now, this is a little bit of a professional and personal sort of Venn diagram. We want to know about their work, but we also want to know about them as a person, so what drives them, what keeps them up at night. We're sort of mixing the personal with the professional a little bit. Um, we've also got, just to spice things up, uh, a wonderful performer by the name of Angeline Penrith, who is joining us tonight. And she's going to bring some of the elements of um, the work and this discussion to life. Um, it's one of the first times that I've seen a performer do that in a panel chat. So I'll let you imagine what that's like and how that will come to life. This series is a collaboration between the Sydney Festival and the Walkley Foundation. A lot of you will know the Walkley Foundation. It celebrates excellence in journalism. It really does set the industry benchmark with the well-known Walkley Awards. Um, top of the journalism pops, if you will. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce the two people that I'm going to be chatting to this evening. Um, they are Lorena Allum. She is a Gamilaroi and Uwalaroi woman whose country lies in the Darawa or Narran Lakes region, which is in far west New South Wales. Some of you may be familiar. Uh, Lorena has been a journalist for 30 years, a journalist and a broadcaster. You may have seen her work on the ABC, Triple J, Radio National. Um, currently, she is the Indigenous Affairs Editor for Guardian Australia. Now, last year, uh, she won a Walkley for her work, along with her colleague, Keller Walquist, for breaking the story about the destruction of the Duke and Gorge. This was a massive story. Uh, it made international headlines. It sparked an inquiry. It ignited protests. Um, and it really just, I think, seeped into our national consciousness and elicited quite a bit of change. Um, not enough, in my opinion, but anyway. Um, she also won a Walkley Award in the same category, which was for coverage of Indigenous affairs for her phenomenal project, The Killing Times, which she's going to be chatting to us about in just a moment. With her this evening as well is Laura Murphy Oates, who is a Nyempa and Walwyn woman from New South Wales. Um, she's the presenter, and she's also the senior producer of a podcast called The Full Story, um, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. If you're not, please familiarise yourself. Um, in 2018, she won the Young Australian Journalist of the Year, the Walkley Award for Young Australian Journalist of the Year, um, and she is just, just top of a game and a general legend. So please welcome Lorena and Laura Murphy-Oates. Welcome, welcome. You're on the far side. Thank you. Top of the game, Jam friend. Thanks. Top of the general <laughs> legend. <laughs> See, I didn't even have that in my notes. It was just something that I'm like, yeah, no, she's at the top of the game. I can say that. That's Thank factually you. accurate. All downhill from here. It cool. is all downhill from totally. <laughs> yes. Um, I guess I want to start with you both, um, and you probably would have heard the intro a little bit. You know, it's professional, but also it's personal. Let's start a little bit with your work, and I want to start with you, Lorena. Um, the Killing Times, it's a phenomenal piece of work. The research is, I, it, it's mind-boggling how you managed to put it together. So I'm going to let you explain to us um, what it is and, and how it actually works as a piece of journalism. Sure. Um, the Killing Times is a project that we entered into at The Guardian in partnership with the U University of Newcastle, who have done all of the, the heavy lifting here and the groundwork in terms of the research. Uh, Professor Lyndall Ryan, who in my view is a national treasure, um, and her team at Newcastle had done a lot of the research and produced a map of their own. She and I started talking about how we might collaborate on a project for the media because I really thought that there was a need for this information to be uh, brought to re our readership in a way that was hard to look away from, but also easy to digest. That was our challenge. So we talked about how we might do that. She said, well, 
why don't you take our data and see what you can do with it? So we started building a map. We also sort of leapt ahead of her team and finished the pass across Australia, if you like, by, by looking at Western Australia. Her team hadn't got to that point at, at that stage. So we used the same methodology. We looked uh, and found at least 16 sites in Western Australia, which you will see on our map. And then, based on all of that information, we started to crunch the data and, and reported based on what that data told us. Things like um, massacres got worse over time, not better. Like, the number of people killed in, in each incident actually increased. Peaked around the mid-1800s, but was still going on right up until 1928. Um, and then we also added features to the map that we thought people would want. We, things like being able to search by time and place and date and also by postcode. So we wanted to really drive home to people that this was not in some remote part of the country a long time ago. This was quite a local event and you can search by your hometown. Um, mm. and, and people found that really, um, um, I think, confronting but also really useful. And in fact, we got a lot of uh, emails and contact from people afterwards saying, there's one near us you didn't have, and what about this one? And, right. and we know about this. So there were, you know, lots of people who who wanted to suddenly talk about this history. Yeah. So it almost became a, a, a bit of a, a, a crowdfunded or a crowd search piece yeah. of piece of work as well. Absolutely. Um, it there's a tremendous amount of research and time mm. that's gone into the creation of that interactive yeah. map. Um, how did you actually go about researching this? How long did it take? for you to compile all this together. Because I don't know if you guys saw there as well, there are actually breakout stories that you can then click yeah. on, um, which are you know pieces of reportage, uh, feature-length stories, news stories that then go into detail a little bit more about the descendants mm -hmm. of um, those that were killed in massacres. That's right. How did you put this all together? Uh, we had... Uh, we had eight months in the end, it took eight months, and there were the, me plus our Guardian team, plus two of my interns from Melbourne University who I've apologised to so much since and said, this was of such a confronting project, it was really traumatising for us all to read this material. Um, but as, on, as well as the map, we wanted, to, we wanted to report on how this data affects living Australians now, and so people who are descended from all sides, not just the survivors, but also the perpetrators, and uh, one person from Queensland who was descended from both sides, who's descended from a, a, a native police officer on her, uh, her mother's side and, and um, a survivor who, who met and married, so, and who has an enormous legacy to, to deal with. Um, we also found a, a, the descendant of a perpetrator who'd come forward for the first time and talked about how she found out that her, um, you know, uh, uh, quite well-respected ancestor was actually one of the people who perpetrated the massacre at Appen outside Sydney. Right. And so we told her story alongside that of Glenda Chalker, who, Aunty Glenda, whose family had descended from the, the f two or three children who survived. So uh, we really wanted to show people that this is a complex history. It is living in people today. Yeah, it it's is, alive. It's still yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, and it needs to be resolved and, yeah. and talked about. Elmo, you've got something, um, a doco that's similar. It's called Reconciling Murder. Before I get you to talk about it, we might just play a little bit of the doco for you. There's dead silence first. There was nothing. And then you have the screams coming. I closed my eyes and like if I could see these horses coming towards me. On the 10th of June, 1838, 12 white stockmen rode into Mile Creek Station. It was a mix of young children, women, men, just going about their lives. They led them away, tied together. Stabbed by bayonets. They tore the limbs from babies. That's all they had, bits and pieces of skulls. They left them to rot. I am Sue Blacklock. I am a descendant of the survivors. My name is Miles Gerard. I am a descendant. One of the 12 white men was John Blake. And I am the great, great grandson of John Blake.
In 1838, 28 Wirraway people were massacred at Mile Creek Station in central New South Wales. Whilst this was part of a much larger killing spree in the area, and just one of many, many massacres across Australia, this moment stands out in our history. It was the first and only time that white perpetrators were brought to justice. Now, the descendants of both sides of this story are trying to make things right. Each year, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people meet at Mile Creek. But this year is pretty special. It's 180 years since the massacre and 20 years since the descendants met for the first time, right here. For 48-year-old nurse Susan Blake, this weekend is her first time visiting the place her ancestor committed a massacre. It's also the first time she will meet the descendants of those he killed. Going to tell the story to someone, it's very uncomfortable at first because they've never really met a direct descendant of a mass murderer. Hello. How are you, darling? I'm good. Retired bank manager Des has been coming to Mile Creek every year for 20 years. How are you feeling about going tomorrow? A little bit nervous. Anybody who lived in Australia on the land in those days who thinks their ancestors weren't involved in massacres, they are kidding themselves. For Des and Susan, learning about their ancestor is a personal passion, but it's what came after the massacre that changed history. The trial was very, very controversial. Being the first trial where white people were, were put on trial for murdering Indigenous people. One of the jurors in the trial made his views on Aboriginal people very clear. I look on the blacks as a set of monkeys and the earlier they're exterminated from the face of the earth, the better. I would never consent to hang a white man for a black one. The white people got off from the all-white jury in 15 minutes. The history starts when they were retried. Of the 12 suspected perpetrators, seven faced a retrial and were hanged. The rest escaped conviction, including John Blake. Years later, John Blake uh, committed suicide and he slit his throat. We would like to believe that he did have a guilty conscience. I hope that he actually grew a heart. This family history is part of the reason that Susan has dedicated her life to Aboriginal health, living and working in remote communities for more than 20 years. People were murdered, people were brutally murdered. You start to learn about the real Australian history, not the fairy tale Australian history that we all learn at school. I only saw that recently, but I'm like, honestly, Sorry, that if you should have come with a bit of a content warning, probably. Sorry, guys. Probably. That's, that's my bad. Thank you for no, pointing that out, Elmer. Um, if you haven't seen that doco, it's, it's all over the internet. I would very much highly recommend that you do, um, just because it was so wonderfully put together as well in making something that happened so long ago feel very much alive today, which is, you know, part of what kind of drives your work as well, Lorena. Tell us about that story. Why? How, how was the pitching process like and, and why a story like that? Well, I first got interested in it, similarly to Lorena, I've been reading the work of Lyndall Ryan and was just kind of blown away that there was this growing movement and understanding in academia and that was spreading out into journalism and into the art world. You know, you had indigenous artists like Judy Watson, who has been doing memorials up at Mile Creek. You have lots of different communities and cities who are kind of recognizing this violent past that I wasn't really taught about in school, mm. even though I was only in school 10, 15 years ago now. Like, it seems kind of insane that this isn't just an essential part of the curriculum, but the thing is, as is kind of shown in the killing times, it was covered up quite a lot of the time. They, there is a lot of evidence for this violence and these massacres and that it's much more widespread than what anyone really has been taught um, in the past 30, 50 years. But, um, that understanding is just starting to come through into popular culture, into a lot of different worlds. So, Do you yeah. feel like you're almost filling a gap there uh, uh, where there hasn't been, I guess, an education in the way that we understand it at schools about issues like this? Is this something that you're sort of 
I mean, that's the hope. Filling with your work? Yeah, I have heard that, you know, that story's been shown in schools and it's, you know, an easy thing for kids to watch, like a doco, and I worked at a Youth Current Affairs show at the time, so... How good's that feedback, though, when you hear <laughs> yeah. your stuff shown in schools? No, it's like, definitely... that's where you want to be shown. It's Don't the best feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good to feel like you're kind of helping to change that narrative, which has just been so wrong for so long. But yeah, I, I had been reading some of that work. I think the New York Times had done a write-up um, with Linda Ryan and, and Judy Watson and had shown a map of, um, you know, a picture of some of the work they'd done on maskers. And I was like, wow, like this, why don't I know more about this? I feel ashamed, really, like mm -hmm. that I, I, you know, knew that there was violence, but not to the extent, really, and a lot of people don't. So, yeah, I started looking into it and realised that there's this incredibly inbuilt story at Mile Creek where all the uh, survivors, or a lot of the survivors who live in the area, and some of the descendants of the perpetrators meet every single year, which is just... I don't know about any community that does that, really. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's incredible. It has been covered before, I think, by the ABC, but... Um, yeah, I went in and tried to find, I suppose, a, a new angle on it to try and find a younger generation who were coming for the first time. And one of them was Susan, and the other one was Miles, who speaks just after that section that we played and kind of followed their journeys going to this moment for the first time, going to the yearly memorial and meeting and having the first conversation that they'd ever had. And it was just absolutely incredible, life-changing for me, going there completely. Yeah. Because um, there is so much misinformation that's still out there mm. uh, and still, you know, I mean, the catalyst of misinformation is social media, mm. right? Mm. Um, and I imagine that you would come across that every day because yeah. you're, pro you're probably on those platforms every day for work. Mm. Um, have you ever kind of had to use... Do you, do you ever use your work as a way of saying, hey, this is evidence that something mm. ha has occurred here it is, here, is the, here are the quotes, here are the images, here are the people, here are the interviews. I probably use my work less. <laughs> I've used Lorena's work, actually. Oh, when, um, you know, you have a new opinion piece, usually around Jan 26, but also all throughout the year by some conservative commentator or, you know, guy on TV, white guy, talking about how we're settled peacefully or downplaying um, this violence in Australian history. And, and this happened on Twitter. Yes. Um, so it's really frustrating to see that, especially when there are journalists who uh, are working their guts out to try and get that evidence, you know, on, in the public domain. And so having something like a resource like The Killing Times, I've kind of screen grabbed some of Lorena's articles sometimes and gone, this is just wrong. Like, go and Google it. Like, go and look at some of the work that's already out there. We don't really have an excuse anymore to not know because people are going and doing the work and digging up all this evidence and making it, you know, easy to read and putting up amazing yeah. emotional stories behind it so that people can understand it. There's no excuse. This is a question for the both of you, but how, how has your work been received in online spaces? Like Twitter or social media or, you know, where we're having these conversations more and more? Mm. Um, well, as, as Laura's just described, there's, there's a bit of pushback, of course, um, but overwhelmingly people are, people are positive about it. That, I mean, if you measure by shares and likes and the number of people who... I mean, the, the initial stories from the Killing Times just bounced around the globe and I was getting emails from people in, in um, the UK and in the US who, who wanted to know more about our project because they wanted to do a similar one there. So it had a huge reach, which... I take to mean that people were hungry for that information mm. and understood that there was so much more to this story, what, that really what we were producing with The Killing Times is the tip of a, an iceberg. Mm. It's not by no means the definitive history of the, the frontier either. There are so many other stories that are yet to be told and so mm. I would like people to see it as, as the opening to a more honest conversation about our history that involves armed resistance and resistance by Aboriginal people because we didn't just all, you know, lay down and die. Yeah. People fought back. And, and so those stories need to be told. Um, what I saw this as an opportunity to do uh, to, to begin that conversation so we could get past the, the resistance on social media, the, the denialists who, who want to cling to that comfortable fantasy that Australia was peacefully settled. We need to get past that and we need... Here's some information so you can face this. And then... Let's have the conversation about what we do 
next? Because mm. mm. we can't keep saying, uh, Australians can't say, well, we can't keep saying, we didn't know. Yeah. Mm. Now you know, so let's take the next step and, and deal with it. Yeah, yeah. there's been um, incredible public reaction to both your works. And actually, to give us a bit of a snapshot of the public reaction, we've got um, very fortunate to have a performer with us. Angeline Penrith is here tonight to take us through some of the reactions. Many Australians have been brought up with the view that the settlement of Australia was largely peaceful. This map turns that on its head. I am inclined to think that a lot of Australians know that it wasn't a peaceful settlement, but choose to ignore the fact. This shit makes me want to throttle my old history teacher. Is this map in the Australian War Memorial? No, there's no memorial for the frontier wars. There needs to be. This map is a part of the truth. And once these events are acknowledged, we may get somewhere. Let's tell the real stories in schools and break the myths for the next generation. Then change may come. I didn't learn the truths until I chose to research it as an adult. My school, history teacher, classes omitted truths about white settlement. The children who come through my primary school classroom can't grow up with a historical blind spot. There are so many teachers working hard to ensure the truth is told now, finally. Yes, the more I learn and understand the truths of history around the first boat people, the more disappointed I feel about how I was lied to at school, allowing me to be ignorantly racist. I remember pulling my primary school teacher history teacher up after he told us about the peaceful settlement and colonizers' sadness at the unfortunate demise of First Nations. He didn't like it one bit. I was lucky to be exposed to the truth by my migrant parents and black friends. This doesn't go far enough. There are twice as many massacres as this. Where's the South Coast or the South Australia on this map? This is massively understated. But also this. Stop knocking Australia Day and move on. Where's the maps that show all the convicts who were shot trying to escape, all the settlers who were speared by Aborigines? Many native police, were told, were brought in from the territory to track and kill other blacks. Try putting that on the map and see if the Guardian readers choke on their avocado toast. This is just careless, lazy work. There are so many inaccuracies and exaggerations. I'm not even prepared to take it seriously. It's left-wing propaganda designed to divide us. Why not do something that unites us instead of just all this special pleading? So many resources are put into this negative version of the past. The convicts were starved and shot for stealing flour as well. I mean, I don't mind this truth-telling, but let's see the whole picture for a change instead of just one perspective. All lives matter. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I love that eye roll at the end. That's, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's perfect. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the Twitter trolls or give them a lot of energy. Well, you want actually to say gave, something? It gave me like a flashback listening to those a tiny bit, mm. which I think is interesting. From working at NITV and SBS, the two Facebooks, right, you would post a story on NITV, you would have hundreds of comments, a lot of mob being like, oh, I feel so validated from this, this is amazing, or well done you, just kind of like an auntie giving you like a <laughs> congratulations, or like a lot of people who just really you know, vibed with the work, but then you post it on SBS, I found, and it was so much more hate. And it's so interesting to see, um, yeah, I suppose a lot of people come to Indigenous media because they're passionate and they love to hear yeah. about some of this stuff, but they come to other media and they're really ready to critique and, and kind of burn you down, like we just heard. <laughs> I mean, how, how do you 
how do you deal with that? Like, does that affect you? And do you have strategies for dealing with that? I feel like I um, do what you're not supposed to do, and I do read the comments. Yeah. Because I actually think that they can be helpful. Like, I want to know what my blind spots are a little bit, but I just have to filter out abuse, you know? It's just like, oh, well, that person really doesn't understand, doesn't want to understand, isn't trying to engage with the work. But then other people are like, oh, did you consider this perspective or did you consider that? And it's really helpful because it yeah. helps me check my own biases. Um, but you can't always read the comments because it can get depressing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You're not on Twitter, Lorena. No. Excellent decision. Why. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, that was a decision I made a, a long time ago because I got death threats and hate. Uh, quite a bit of hate around an earlier time. Uh, when I used to work at the ABC, during the height of the first wave of Pauline Hanson, I had a caller who used to ring up and shout abuse and started a chainsaw, started his chainsaw on the phone to me one afternoon. Mm. So at that point, I decided I would use social media for my own private business. I'm not on Twitter, no. Yeah. So mm. I have, <laughs> I'm a coward, really. I've got Laura and others to fight those battles. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But I also feel like I, uh, I agree with Laura to it that, that it's important to hear feedback, particularly from Mob, about where you can improve and where you've, you've missed, uh, missed something really important. That really matters, and in, in a lot of ways, that feedback is the most important to me. Yeah. What, what kind of feedback do you value the most? Yeah. And, and have you ever sort of gotten feedback where you've rolled your eyes a little bit? Yeah, I have. Um, it's not feedback so much as vitriol. So it's hard to it's hard to f filter through someone's rude, angry, aggressive, abusive email to to that little nugget of advice. And often I I don't because I have feelings too, and I don't want to have to. I, you know, there's a lot of that stuff. We do get hate mail and all sorts of threats. Um, but when people give me feedback that is, you know, fair even if it, it's hurtful and hard to hear, it's really important. Mm. If I, and, and when you're doing this kind of work, there, there is a real responsibility to do it right and do it in a culturally appropriate way and make sure that you've done the right thing by Aboriginal people. Because for mm. so long, the media has been the kind of one of the great columns of oppression, you know, like it, the way that the media has misrepresented Aboriginal people over, over time has, has is part of the problem. So it's really important to get mm. honest feedback. And that's the good thing about our mob is they'll just tell you straight. <laughs> oh, if yeah. you're stuffed up, they'll just <laughs> tell you straight. And that's really important. Yeah. But I, I find I get private messages from mob as well. If you, they feel like, oh, I don't know how you've kind of phrased that thing. There's a lot of like talking behind the scenes, which I find really lovely. Like it's just mm. like, oh, okay, we appreciate the work that you're doing and, and where you're coming from, but maybe think about this. It's a little nudge and you've got to be open to that and take it on very much so. Yeah. yeah. I guess there is a balance. Um, well, I, I don't know. I'll put the question to you. Mm. Do you think that there is a balance in, you know, listening to the communities that you report on mm. and also working within, you know, a white media organisation that has certain time constraints or wants to pitch things in a certain way or whatever? How do you balance that? Mm. It's incredibly hard. I mean, I'm, me and Lorena have actually been working on a project in the past couple of months where we've been doing that and it's been really interesting. I feel like I came from this media perspective in the first couple of years where I was working in TV where it was like, you are the creator of this story. You know, you are the producer and you, it's your right to tell this story and you're shedding light on a thing which never really sat right with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that can be very prevalent in TV media, especially so. But coming and working with Arena on this project we've just been doing that came out this week, Childhood and Custody, there's been some chats about how you negotiate that. You know, if there's a young Indigenous kid who's incredibly vulnerable, they've shared their story with you. You can sit and go through the story with them and, and you know, make sure that they're represented properly. It's, you're not the master of someone else's life and their story. It's an incredible responsibility to take on. And mm. I'm updating my processes and how I work all the time because, yeah, I'm, I'm still learning. It's so interesting because it's such a no-no in TV. Like, it's like, oh, no, we're not going to show you the story before it airs or we couldn't possibly, we just don't do that, you know. Like, we have to have though? full control of the story. So, yeah. story. 
<laughs> but you can't do that all the time. But yeah, I think there's certain um, times where it's appropriate, you know. Yeah. Um, who inspires you? Um, I feel like my first editor for a lot of my stories is my sister. Um, she works in Indigenous theatre for a company called Mughalin, and she's a better writer than me, absolutely. Like, <laughs> but she doesn't write a lot. Yeah. So I'll, you know, be working on a, on a story and feel like, oh, I'm not, I'm not expressing this right. Like any opinion piece that I've written, because I'm terrified about writing opinion pieces, I'll go and be like, I'm trying to say this. And she might come back and be like, I think what you mean is this perfectly <laughs> written paragraph. I'd be like, yeah, good, good one. So <laughs> I, think, I think she should get a co-credit on, you know, half of my work actually. Yeah. Um, she's an incredible inspiration, but uh, a lot of my mates who work in Indigenous media, um, one of my close mates is Rachel Hocking, who's presenter at NITV. She's just an incredible journo and staunch young black woman, so loves her. What is it about her that, that draws her to you or inspires you? I remember she started, because we were both cadets at NITV and SBS, and um, she started a year or so after me and as a year or so younger than me. And then she wrote this opinion piece in her first week where she just called out Andrew Bolt and said he was a dickhead, basically, and <laughs> talked about his, um, how his writing had impacted her all throughout her teen years and early 20s and how wrong he was on, on core issues. And I was like, oh, you're brave. Like, I don't want to poke the bear of... Andrew Bolt, when I'm 23, you know, mm. working in media, that seems terrifying. She was like, nah, you know, it's just, we're sick of this. We don't need this. And I'm going to call it out, which I thought was just so awesome. Yeah. So like a strength and a, and a bravery to put yourself out there in public. Strength, and bravery, a sense of service to community above, you know, anything else. Yeah. yeah. And are there people that you sort of uh, draw strength from or think about when your work gets a bit overbearing or maybe your work situation is a bit overbearing? Mm -hmm. Is there people that you seek advice from? I mean, I think as much as making a story is overbearing, having lived through that and experienced some of the experiences that we're going through is more overbearing, the people that we're telling the story on. So, sure. you know, it is confronting and there's a lot of, like, vicarious trauma when you're talking about deaths in custody and you're talking about massacres, but this is what mob and community are going through and there's so many of these stories. So you can't, you've got to check in with your mental health, but these stories need to be told and you kind of draw strength from the people that are brave enough to come and speak about them and be on camera or have their face in an article, you know? Mm, mm. Lorena, who inspires you? Yeah, you like that? <laughs> like yeah. That was a good answer. Um, yeah. Who inspires you? People like um, people who think about the long game, you know, that think about the, the work they do in terms of the legacy it's going to leave behind. Um, there's a, an older, older lady who passed away now who I used to ask the question, what kind of ancestor are you going to be? And I always think of that. I think it's a really profound thing we should all ask ourselves. What are you going to leave behind for the next generation? And someone who I think embodies that work is Romaine Morton who is a filmmaker and a writer and a poet and who thinks really deeply on a, on a level that most of us don't ever get to. Like she's quite, um, she thinks about her work in, in its spiritual sense, not just in the impact it's going to have on her and the people who, who receive it. Yeah, yeah, so she's very inspiring. And how did you come across her? What, what drew you to her? Um, well, we met a long time ago um, when she was first writing poetry and doing a lot of spoken word poetry and I was working on a radio program on RN called Away. So I, we used to just get her in the studio all the time just because she was awesome. We'd go, yeah, come in and do a poem and she'd bring her, her musicians and we just recorded heaps of stuff. She then produced a, a collection called Post Me to the Prime Minister. Um, and since then has done a lot of work. She's done a lot of uh, academic work as well as um, creative stuff and, and made films as well. Yeah. Well, Romaine Morton has written a poem called I Shall Surprise You by My Will. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to actually have had permission from um, Romaine Morton to actually read the poem. And Angeline Penrith is going to read that poem for you this evening. It's called I Shall Surprise You by My Will.
I will make oppression work for me, with a turn and with a twist. Be camouflaged within stated ignorance, then rise. I surprise you by my will. I will make oppression work for me, with a turn and with a twist. I shall sit cross-legged like a trapdoor, then rise. I surprise you by my will. I will let you pass me over, believe me stupid and ill-informed. And once you believe me gone or controlled, I will rise and surprise you by my will. I shall spring upon you words familiar, then watch you regather as they drop about. Like precious tears, thick with fear, hear you scream and shout. Then I shall watch convictions break away, crumble like paper bags. Then as beauty, I shall rise and surprise you by my will. It is only when you believe me gone shall I rise from this place where I wait, cross-legged, wait to surprise you by my will. In the alleys, in the clubs, in the parliaments, in the courts of law, parking cars, driving buses, and generally watching you, watching me, as you pass me by, I shall sit cross-legged, wait to surprise you by my will. For I shall stumble upon houses of education, I shall stumble upon institutions of reform, I shall stumble over rocks, over men, over women, and over children, and surprise you by my will. I shall stumble over poverty, over policy, and over prejudice, weary and torn. I stumble. Then, bleary and worn, I shall rise from this place where I wait, cross-legged, wait, and surprise you by my will. For the mountains we crossed, they were easy. And the rivers we swam, they were easier still. And even then, as I attempted to outrun inhumanity, I surprise you by my will. I have witnessed the falling of many, heard them cry and hear them still. Even with grief inside me growing, I command my spirit to rise and surprise you by my will. And for all the people, we are here and we are many, and we shall surprise you by our will. We shall rise from this place where you expected to keep us down, and we shall surprise you by our will. For the bullets we dodged, they were difficult. And this ideological warfare, more difficult still. But even now, as we challenge inhumanity, we shall rise and surprise you by our will. That was a beautiful poem. Um, what goes through your mind when, when you hear something like that read out? Um, I think it's, it's um, nourishing. To hear those words spoken out loud, to hear, to, like, someone recognises how you feel, um, that, that it's being named and that it, that it has voice, yeah, I think it's, it's really um, nourishing is the word, I, it's the only other word yeah. I, I can think of really. Ella, do you, have you ever sort of connected with a piece of work like that where it's kind of done something to you or for you? I feel like there's so much amazing writing coming out at the moment, I've got like a stack of books next to my bed of <laughs> Indigenous writers, which completely, um, um, it's going to take me another five years to get through because I read at snail's pace. But something recently actually, um, oh God, I'm going to completely forget the name of it. <laughs> um, oh, what's it called? It won a big award last year. The I'll come around to it. Tara June? It wasn't Tara June, it was the year before. Oh, no, you got me. I'll come around to it, but it's, um, <laughs> it's a book where the, um, at the first page or so, the animals are speaking in language and she ro rocks up on a motorbike and she starts talking to the, to the crows on the road. Is that Melissa's book? Melissa, M Melissa, Melissa Lukashenko. Lukashenko. Oh, that, yep. And I just, like, 
burst into tears reading the first few pages because I felt like, wow, like, yeah, I, I, it was such a beautiful opening and centering of connection to land and country. And then I went to go see her speak uh, last year, year before, and went up to get my book signed by her and was like, the moment where the birds speak, and she's, she's very staunch, she was just like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here. <laughs> Sign my book. I was like, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> and yeah. what's that book called for anyone in the audience who might oh, want to um, follow too that much up? Lip. Too much lip. Oh, yeah. too much lip. Too much lip. <laughs> By Melissa Lukashenko. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing. Um, in this line of work, what, what keeps you up at night? Oof, that's a big question. Marina, you want to take that no, one you first? you can go thank first. You. <laughs> um, what keeps... Uh, it's nerve-wracking the night before a big project goes out, oh, yeah. you, I, you don't sleep much, there's a lot of pacing and a lot of mentally triple checking every, every fact, every, every word really, because mm. particularly with the killing times, Lyndall and I were both concerned about the way that the history wars played out in the 90s and we didn't want to start another one, mm. so we were really, really conscious. So sometimes it's uh, terror goes through your mind the night before, a, bi a big piece. What else keeps me awake, apart from my darling children who are teenagers, is that I've, that I've um, done the right thing, that, it, that the story is right, that it's, um, it's the very best I can do, um, and that I've left nothing behind. Yeah, that keeps me up. But then I feel rage that I'm even writing these stories. You feel rage? Yeah, I'm angry that I have to, that, I ha that this is the state that our mob live in. And, and there are some kinds of stories that I've been writing since I was a young journo a long time ago. And, there, and that's, I mean, certainly when you talk about deaths in custody, um, to be writing stories about people dying in very similar situations to those that prompted a royal commission in 1991 is really frustrating. So those things keep me up, the frustrations. Yeah, how do you deal with them? I've got a very good family who will let me Brand, <laughs> but stuff. also just just understand when things are stressful. Um, I've got uh, um, good friends who've got excellent senses of humour and take, help me take my mind off it. But there's some some of that trauma you carry with you. There are things that I read and saw during working on the Killing Times that won't ever leave me. Um, but as Laura said before, people who have lived this life. Um, I mean, we're just bearing witness to their lived experience and, and that's, you know, that's nothing compared to what they've been through. Yeah. Yeah, Elmo? I think Arena touches on something that I think about a lot, which is like when you're reporting in Indigenous media, are you putting people's trauma on stage for nothing? Like, is this going to change anything? And if not, should we be going through this process. And that's why, you know, I'm kind of learning as I go how to negotiate that because there is a point where, you know, there's so much suffering in communities and certain families and you do want to tell that story, but for an effect because it's exhausting for black people to have to tell them over and over again for 30 years through royal commissions and then for nothing to change. Mm. It can be, it's a bit haunting to think that, you know, you'll go to a lot of effort to fact check a story and go through it and convince someone like, you know, I think this is worth telling, but you just got to hope that something will change. And sometimes things do, but it's just incremental. You can never tell whether any one particular story or and your work is really leading to that change necessarily. Yeah. So you just, I mean, how, how do you kind of make that decision and, and can you even make that decision? Like, can you know if a story is going to elicit some kind of change or do you ever get to a point where you're like, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this story because it's just gonna end up taking people through all this pain for nothing? I think I'm more and more making decisions uh, in presenting where, you know what, I don't need to ask that question. Like, someone hints at something that was really hard for them to go through, we don't need to, you know, talk through it in this podcast to the point where, or this article, to the point where you're reliving it in a, in a way that's too hard for you. I mean, I think it's a real balancing act because you don't want to re-traumatise people, but you need to highlight, you know, what's going on with deaths in custody or, 
you know, mm. whatever situation that they're going through. So I don't think there's any one answer. It's sussing out what people are comfortable with as well and what they want, because mm. if you have an honest conversation with them about, you know, what being involved in a project could do, um, and you don't oversell it in any way, and they're like, look, I just, I really want to tell this story, and if it achieves X, Y, Z, that'll be great for me, then that's good. Mm. And the other part of our job as journalists is to hold the institutions to account who are responsible for the way that people are treated. So you can tell a story in a trauma-informed way without, you know, that, that so that individual isn't having to hang it all out there all over again. Um, but take that story and put it to the politicians and to put it to the policy makers right. and say, yeah. what are you doing about this? It doesn't or, just end there when yeah, you tell that's the right. story. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. So part of the, the important part of that is pushing for someone to be accountable um, for that. Mm. So um, I think a good example might be with the, um, the stuff about Rio Tinto and Jugan Gorge. Mm. Um, it, was, it was about just keeping on pushing and keeping on asking questions because it was clear that there were, uh, there was a real miscarriage of, there were, there were factors here where uh, traditional owners were deeply outgunned by the mining industry and they were being um, um, limited by these so-called gag clauses in, in arrangements with mining companies. That's just wrong. And so it wasn't just a matter of putting out, making, making people understand the trauma of the PKKP people and mm. how devastated they were because they, and they remain traumatised by what happened to their sacred place. It was about making sure that the, those people who were responsible were, were held to account. Yeah. I mean, hearing you both speak tonight, it's, it's clear to me, I don't know if it's clear to you guys as well, that there's a shift in focus in your work from the audience being, you know, the main entity, I suppose, mm to the community and who you're actually reporting on and the people in the story being the main focus. Mm. And you saying, you know, when something comes up, you think, oh, no, I'm not going to ask that question. I don't need to ask that question. Mm. Because your focus is on the person in front of you yeah. and what asking that question is going to do to them. Mm. Um, and I think, why don't we do that more? Like, why is that not the thing that we do? Because... Mm. We don't really. We think you're trained to ask that question. You're trained to like, yeah, somebody alludes to something, probe that. Mm. Ask mm. more. The audience deserves to know. But I do wonder why we don't shift our focus a little bit more actually to the people that we're reporting on. Mm. I feel like I've been untraining myself from right. some of the stuff that I was taught in the first few years of media. Now kind of making my own way and... Um, thinking about the ethics of my work. Because there's no set, this is exactly the ethical guideline that you need to do in any one situation in journalism. You're kind of, I think, learning by surrounding yourself with people who you think do good work and have a good head on their shoulders and um, care about the same things that you do. And then you learn from them as you're going in your career. Um, and yeah, if you're in a situation where people are maybe sensationalising stories or don't have the right approach to storytelling. Mm. It can be tough as a young journo, for sure. Mm. I, I just think of, I think I want to highlight the fact that uh, journalism broadly does do that for people who are suffering. I mean, we, we, we as a profession need to get better at, at dealing with people who mm. are traumatised. Mm. But I'm thinking about the bushfire coverage and there was an enormous sympathy for people who'd lost everything in the bushfires. There, you know, there was a lot of, <laughs> possibly not by our Prime Minister at the time, but certainly journalists who, who were there and uh, who, on, in the main, were quite um, respectful of people's pain and didn't... You know, they didn't go up and say, hey, well, how do you feel? Like that awful question that gets asked sure. when someone's just lost their family in a car accident. Well, how do you think I feel? Mm. Um, there, there was sympathy. There was empathy in the coverage. Um, I think what Laura and I are trying to say is that that empathy and sympathy needs to extend, be extended to Indigenous people. And so mm. often it isn't. I mean, we, mm. I, I can't tell you how many times we're covering deaths in custody the response is, oh, well, they shouldn't have been in jail or, mm. you know, that they were asking for... That, that mentality that, that our lives are less important. So the idea of 
being trauma informed, if you like, when you're talking to Indigenous people, it's just extending the same courtesy to to us as, as other other Australians get. Mm. Mm. For sure. Is there a mantra or a piece of advice that you live by? I don't know uh, that I live by, but I think when I'm stressing about a story, there's um, this podcast host, uh, PJ Vote, who does this podcast, Reply All, and they um, went on another podcast, Long Form, to talk about how they make the, their um, episodes. And I really love, it's a very silly and fun show, but it does some great journalism sometimes as well. And there's this thing that he said, where it was like, every story wants to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> And that has been so helpful to me throughout the years because when I'm just like, but this bit isn't going here and what if we go there and then they don't show up and it's like, well, of course that might happen and of course it's going to happen, probably, maybe, but every story wants to be bad and you just need to do your best to try and make it good, <laughs> to make it come together. Like, you're in a chaotic world where yeah. anything can happen and, you know, sometimes the story just beautifully comes together and you have to work as hard as you can at it and hope that it does. That's such a good starting point. Yeah. Every story wants to be bad. Yeah. That's why this is like this. Yes. It's my job to, exactly. to fix it or make it better. Okay, I like that. Just whisper it under my breath when things are yeah. going wrong. Do you have any personal sort of, that? I mean, that one pertains to work. Mm. Any, anything in your personal life that you think of? A mantra, a piece of advice that you've been given? I mean, I feel like that same mantra applies to everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything wants to be chaotic and you just need to muddle through. <laughs> okay. Mm. Lorena, do you have a mantra or a mm. piece of advice you live by? No, but my, my dad was full of great advice, none of which I can say here because there's probably a bit of We're swearing. We're all friends. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I think tell the truth and shame the devil. Tell the truth. I think that's a... Mm. You know, whatever you do in life, trying to make sure that you, you do it right, that you do, you do the right thing by people and you do the best that you can do in your, in your professional and personal life. Yeah, that's a mantra. Is that a mantra? <laughs> tell, yeah, the truth. tell the truth. That is a mantra. Yeah. That works, yeah. yeah. I feel like whenever I... Another one, actually, that I just thought of is whenever I call my dad and I'm like, oh, this thing's happening with this story and this thing at work, or, uh, his response is always, fuck him. <laughs> and it's just that's not great advice but it's just it's a um a reset of just like oh some of this is not as important as, right as maybe you think you know? just having that perspective yeah there. there's a lot of journalists can get in their zone and think that yeah whatever work they're doing at any particular time is very very important it's but the yeah. most important we're yeah. not yeah, we're not surgeons yeah <laughs> yeah there is a there is a sort of a very um you know small I was going to call it a peep hole, but it's, that's a better <laughs> word for it, surely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, it's just a very kind of narrow, narrow sort of view, but broadening out that perspective obviously seems to be something that's mm. important to the both you, of you. You go home to your family and they don't care, really. Yeah. They want you to, you know, did you get the milk or, you know, the cat needs to go to the vet or, I mean, you know, mm. it's important to, to remember that life goes on. And that's another mantra, that whatever really crappy thing you're dealing with today, the sun will still come up tomorrow and it'll be different. And you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. <laughs> See, you do have mantras. <laughs> like, People yeah. hate the mantras question, but Mine then they get ruder. on a roll yeah. <laughs> and they love it. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about um, a moment for you that um, meant something in, in your career, either because it was particularly challenging or because it was particularly poignant or because you learnt something about yourself for whatever reason. Is there a moment throughout your careers that has stood out for you and why? I'll let Lorena take that. <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm thrilled by that. Um, this was a totally rogue question as yeah. well. It's like, I just um, feel like asking it. It wasn't, it wasn't a in journalism, though, so does that still count? Yeah. <laughs> Back in 1993, I was working on the World Indigenous Peoples Conference of, on Education, which was being held at Wollongong University. And at that time, there was this great team of Indigenous people working at the South Australian Museum, which is the place where the anthropologist Norman Tyndale's photographs had been held, along with another number of other really um, amazing collections. Um, but the team at the university had been going around Australia with these books of photographs, um, just showing them to as many blackfellas as they could find. 
Um, and Norman Tyndale had been to the reserve where my grandmother was born and her um, people before her. And my auntie, who was at the conference, called me over and she said, come here, come here, come here. And we sat in front of those, those photo books for like an hour and a half and she told me who everybody was. That's your great, great auntie, that mum there, here's oh, your wow. cousin, he was born here. Like we just, I just got this massive family history. And, and in the end, she showed me a photograph of my grandmother's grandmother, who was 90 at the time, and she was in this big old overcoat held together with a safety pin. And she told me the story of what happened to that old lady when they shifted her off her country, Yawalari country, to the reserve at Brewarana at the age of 90. They took her away from her country. Um, and it was, it was just, yeah, it was a, a beautiful, I cried, she cried, we all cried. It was, yeah. And so those photos are really, really important to me and I could take them back to the family and they've been going around the family ever since. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And it was only because I was working in the media that I had that um, opportunity. Yeah. So I'm really grateful. I feel like this has happened to like a lot of Indigenous journos where you're on a story and you meet a cousin. Like <laughs> it's happened to me twice where, which is amazing, like a lot of my family is still reconnecting in a lot of different ways and like I, working at NITV, I met a cousin twice on a story. Like I was driving around Burke on a driving program and I realised that the guy who was, you, you know, you start the chat like, oh, who's your mob and this family and this family. I was like, oh, you're married to my cousin. <laughs> and another time, like, interviewing someone at Redfern, then, you know, you figure out that you're related. And it's just this incredible sense of, like, okay, I'm here on, on this job, but I'm kind of just reconnecting in a whole different way as part of my daily work. It's incredibly nourishing and valuable. It's, you know, not just a, a job. For sure. Yeah. I want to ask you a final question. I mean, this um, Walkley series is called The Journalist Gene. Um, we often talk about journalists having a nose for news that no one really knows what that means. A journalist gene, what is it? And do you have it? Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think I come from a long line of storytellers, that's for sure, and I'm sure Laura would say the same thing. Like, that's the one thing that our families do is we sit around and tell stories and some of them are really hilarious. Like I'd, I'd love to have the, the performance ability of my cousins and my uncles and aunties, the way that they tell stories. So if there's a gene, that's where it comes from, mm. um, definitely. But I also think what, it's about just knowing when something's wrong and, and needing to correct the record. Like I just can't, mm. like, can't bear it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a pedant. I don't know, but it's, it's that's if that's the gene, it's the one. Oh, you would to hate tell. Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well I'd, I'd get into argue. Oh, that's right. That's why I'm not on because I would yeah. just get myself cancelled in the first 24 hours. <laughs> but um, I I think yeah, telling the truth, not being able to rest when something is wrong, and making sure that the the record tells the truth. Yeah. That's Elmo, do you reckon that's a journalist gene? I, I think. What Lorena says is true, but I really kind of balk at the idea of a journalist gene, partly because it kind of makes me think about when people talk about, oh, well, that, that journalist has got the it factor, or, oh, they always get that story done. And, like, you kind of dig closer, and sometimes you realise that, well, that person has um, class, race, the level of privilege that so many people in Australia are not afforded. You know, we live in a media landscape where a lot of the gatekeepers are white and hire people who are like them, who have similar views and ideas. So to, I think people are innate storytellers and some people have you know, inquisitive minds, but I think a lot of people have given the chance and the opportunity and the you know, tutoring and, and um, care could be amazing journalists, but Australia really, I think, prioritises some storytellers over others. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's just a fabulous note to end on. <laughs> um, couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, I'd get you guys to thank our two wonderful guests, Lorena Allam and Laura Murphy-Oates. Yeah. Thank you so much <laughs> you. to both of you for being here. Um, thank you to all of you for being um, a really great audience. I do just want to thank also you. thank Angeline Penrith, our wonderful performer this evening. Where are you, Angeline? Hey, yes. Angeline. Thank you so much for your wonderful words this evening.
Um, and thank you to our director, Alana Valentine, as well. I don't know if she's um, here, but if we can give her a round of applause too, because yeah. she put all of this together. Thank you, Alana. <laughs> um, I do want to let you know that tomorrow there are going to be two more sessions like this. Uh, ben Law is going to be chatting to Pat Abud about doing diversity. That's happening uh, tomorrow at midday. And then he's also going to talk to Chris Reason about the Lint Cafe siege. Chris is the Channel 7 reporter who was pretty much across the road when it happened. So they're the next two talks happening um, tomorrow if you're keen to see them. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you so much. Please do send any feedback that you have to the Sydney Festival about these talks. Um, we'd love to know how we can improve and how we can make them better for you next time. Um, once again, you have been a fabulous audience and it's lovely to have you all here in person. So thank you so much for coming out this evening.